There have been close to 200 Roman emperors, from Augustus to Constantine XI, and they have died in a wide variety of ways, from ordinary like old age, disease and poison, to exotic and ridiculous like being struck by lightning and getting beaten to death with a bucket. Battlefield deaths, however, are surprisingly rare. If you stretch a definition of a death on a battlefield, you can count about 10 of those, depending on which version of the events you believe in some cases. Some of them were at the hands of fellow Romans during a civil war, but in six cases, an emperor has been killed by a foreign enemy. Persians, Bulgars and Turks each claimed one life, while the absolute champions are the Goths, who have slain three different emperors. Persians will have you believe that they've also killed Gordon III in battle, but their claim is dubious. Battlefield deaths of her emperors were momentous events for Rome. Today we are going to talk about each of those events, how they happened, why they happened, and what they meant for the empire and the world at large. The first Roman emperors to have died at the hand of a foreign foe were Decius and his son Herennius Etruscus. Decius came to power in uncertain times. The year was 249 AD. Fourteen years before his ascension, a troubled Severan dynasty came to an end. Three years after that, a civil war shook the empire. The predecessor of Decius, Philip the Arab, was weak and indecisive. His response to barbarian raids on the Danube did not impress the legions, so they decided to make Decius take his place. Decius was a well-respected senator, a man of great reputation. Surely the citizens and the Senate of Rome were hoping for a long and stable reign that will put an end to the troubled times. His death would be a sign that the crisis was far from over. A year and a half after his ascension, the Danubian provinces were invaded by Carpi, Goths and other barbarians. A Gothic army of 70,000 led by King Kniva crossed the Great River and advanced into Thrace, while a small detachment laid siege to the city of Marcianopolis. Decius came in strong, defeating Cnipus' host near Nicopolis, but his army was later shattered by a surprise attack at the Battle of Beroe. This victory gave the Goths enough time to sack the big imperial city of Philippopolis, while the Romans were reorganizing. Laden with treasure looted from Philippopolis, Goths turned north to their homeland, while Decius pursued them with his three reorganized legions. Loot was weighing down the Gothic host, and the Romans were gaining ground on them with each day. Earlier loss did not diminish Decius's confidence in his army's superiority. Those were Roman soldiers, trained warriors. They are not going to get jumped this time, so barbarians did not stand a chance. But in his overconfidence, Decius made a fatal mistake. He let Kniva pick the spot for the battle, and Kniva made everything of this opportunity. In a marshland northwest of the city of Abritus, just south of the Danube, Kniva arranged his men in three lines. His first two lines were obscuring the view of the boggy terrain in front of his third line. The legions, in their pursuit of what they thought was a fleeing enemy, smashed into the Gothic ranks. The battle started off terrible for the Romans, as Decius's son and co-ruler, Herennius, was killed by an arrow in the opening skirmish. But Decius rallied his troops to keep pushing on. The legend says that Decius stood over the corpse of his son and proclaimed, let no one mourn, the death of one soldier is no great loss for the Republic. As the legionnaires pressed forward, the first Gothic line started to crumble. Then the second gave way. Assured that the victory was close, the Romans charged toward the third Gothic line. Only then did they realize their mistake. The swamp beneath them was dragging them down. The remnants of the first two Gothic lines rejoined the battle at the flanks. Surrounded on three sides and knee-deep in a bog, Romans got ready for the last stand, but there was no way to victory from there. Chaos and slaughter ensued. The bodies of Decius and Herennius were never recovered. The death of Decius was a massive hit for the prestige of the empire. The legions were destroyed, and the emperor himself lay dead on the battlefield. The empire no longer looked invincible to the outside world. In the coming decades, its strength would be put to more tests by barbarian raids, attacks from Sassanid Persia, plagues and revolts, and only through good leadership, determination and eventually some luck will it be able to pull through and overcome the crisis. A 
It is rather surprising that Decius was the only emperor to fall in battle with foreign enemy throughout the whole 3rd century crisis. Emperor Valerian got captured by the Persians in 260 AD, but that's a topic for another video. For a whole century since the Battle of Abritus, Rome was spared of truly disastrous military encounters. This streak was broken in 363 during the Persian campaign of Julian the Apostate. Emperor Julian's death was as quixotic as his reign. Julian is famous for trying to reverse the Christianization of the empire and reintroduce paganism as the imperial religion. He issued several edicts to this effect, but to make his policy stick, he needed a lot of prestige. And to get that prestige, he needed a big military victory. Simply burning barbarian huts would not suffice. He needed to invade Persia. Julian's Persian campaign got off to a good start. He advanced by Euphrates, capturing territory along the way. In a clever plan, Julian reopened an abandoned canal connecting Tigris and Euphrates and reached the Persian capital Ctesiphon before the Persian army could react. But after they won a small battle outside of the city walls, the luck of the Romans had turned. In the sixty years since it was last sacked by the Emperor Galenus, Ctesiphon had got new fortifications for which Julian did not bring adequate siege equipment. Without proper equipment, Julian and his army had to sit for days beside the city walls, while the Persian army amassed nearby. Finally, seeing no other options, the Romans decided to withdraw for the safety of their own territory and regroup. But it was easier said than done. Julian did not plan to retreat, so earlier he ordered to burn the ships that got them here. This meant that to get back, they'd have to march through Persian territory. Preparing for this turn of events, the Persians had completely stripped the land on the route to Rome of supplies. Now Julian's army had to endure a march through that territory, while being constantly harassed by the Persians. In one of those engagements, Julian would meet his fate. Rushing to fight off yet another Persian raid, Julian neglected to put on his armor, and in the following skirmish suffered a wound to the stomach. Julian was treated by his personal physician for three days, periodically regaining consciousness, until finally dying on the third night. Julian's death ended the Constantine dynasty, which had ruled the empire for over fifty years. It had also left the main imperial army of the east without a leader in hostile territory. Julian's successor, Jovian, who had been elected by the army, had to cede Roman territory to the Persians to negotiate a safe passage. Julian's death is also an important event, because now we'll never know what would have happened had he survived. Would his efforts result in a return to the Roman paganism, or was the rise of Christianity too strong to resist? The answer to this question will forever remain a mystery. In the middle of our list is the turning point for the Empire, the Battle of Adrianople and the death of Emperor Valens. Adrianople is the top candidate for the event that started the fall of the Empire in the West. Before this battle, the Empire had its problems, but since Diocletian ended decades of turmoil, the Romans were able to deal with each crisis before the next one came along. Adrianople changed the game. For the next century, the Empire will struggle to stabilize after each blow, never completely recovering its strength, until in 476 its western part would be put out of its misery. The battle itself was a culmination of a border crisis, caused by the displacement of hundreds of thousands of Goths. This displacement was started by the Huns arriving from the east in the second half of the 4th century. Everyone unlucky to get in their path had to choose, submit to their rule or be destroyed. The Goths were no exception. The story of Valens's downfall starts similar to that of Decius, with tens of thousands of Goths amassing beyond the Danube. But this time they did not come to raid and pillage. This time they wanted permission to settle in imperial borders. They wanted the protection that those borders offered against the coming Huns. Settling the barbarians within Roman territory had been an imperial policy for a long time at this point in history. But there were rules that Romans followed when settling the barbarians on their lands. They had to be met with an overwhelming military force, disarmed and dispersed into small groups. This time was going to be trickier, because the Goths numbered in the tens of thousands and most of the Roman forces were in the east, preparing for invasion of Persia. 
This was a situation that had to be dealt with carefully. Instead, Roman commander Lupicinus, who was in charge of the lower Danube frontier, decided to use it as an opportunity to enrich himself. The Goths, who awaited their permission to enter the empire, were short on food, so he was selling them supplies at exorbitant prices. Some Goths had to sell their children into slavery to afford food so they would not starve. Expectedly, the Goths mutinied. In response, Lupicinus invited Gothic leaders to a dinner at his quarters at Marsianopolis and imprisoned them, thinking it would quell the revolt. Instead, it angered the Goths even more. Once they learned of treachery done to their leaders, they amassed at Marsianopolis, demanding Lupicinus' head. One of the Gothic leaders, Fritigern, convinced Lupicinus to free him, telling him that he would go and calm his people. He did convince his people to leave Marsianopolis, but instead of leading them back to their camps, he organized them to break the rest of their countrymen out and go on a pillaging campaign in the Roman countryside. Now, instead of farmers for the land and recruits for their army, the Romans had a hostile military force ransacking the province of Thrace. The war with Persia had to be postponed, and the Eastern Emperor had to come himself and deal with the crisis. A call for reinforcement was also sent to Valens's nephew, the Western Emperor Gratian. In summer 378, Valens came to Thrace with his forces. In early August, he was informed that Fritigern was moving his army of around 10,000 towards Adrianople. On the 9th of August, Valens marched his force to meet the Goths. Assured of his superiority in numbers, he wasn't going to wait for reinforcement from the west, not willing to share a victory with his nephew. After a seven-hour march, tired Romans arrived at the foot of the hill on which Fritigern deployed his army around his supply wagons. Fritigern tried to negotiate with the emperor, stalling the situation so his own reinforcements could arrive. For hours this went on, further exhausting the Romans, who had to endure extreme heat after a long march. Finally, the battle started in a confused fashion. When a Roman left flank cavalry under the command of Iberian prince Bacurius advanced without orders. This attack was repulsed, but regular Roman troops pushed the Gothic line all the way back to the wagon train. The victory seemed within reach, but then the Gothic cavalry arrived. This detachment was scattered around the countryside prior to the battle, so the Roman scouts did not account for it in their report to the Emperor. The arrival of Gothic and Alan riders on the battlefield took the Romans completely by surprise. They smashed into the Roman flank, splintering their ranks. Panicked Roman units began to rout. His own bodyguard abandoned Valens. The Emperor joined the elite Palatine guard, who still held the line, and sent orders to his Batavian reserves in the last attempt to turn the battle, but they had already left the field. Fighting among the veteran soldiers, Valens was struck by an arrow. He may have died then and there, but some sources state that he was taken by the survivors to a house in a nearby village. When the night came, the Goths burned the village, unknowingly killing the wounded emperor. The defeat at Adrianople and the death of Phalens meant that Goths were now pillaging the Middle Empire uncontested while the East had no leader. Valens' successor, Theodosius, had to spend years mustering a new force to contend with the Goths, and even then he would avoid a confrontation, fearing what another defeat would bring. In a peace treaty signed in 382, he would cede the Goths the right to settle in Roman territory under their own authorities. This war had shifted the balance of power in Rome's relations with barbarians. The territory they lived on was still nominally Roman, but the Goths would live there under their own leaders and with their own laws and customs. In 410 AD, the Goths under Alaric would sack the city of Rome, an event that can be easily traced back to that hill, seven hours' march from Adrianople. From 378 to 811 AD, no Roman emperor had died by the hand of a foreign foe. The Battle of Plisca would change that. By 811, the Western Empire had already fallen, so the only Roman emperors remaining were those of the East. Nicephorus I came to power after overthrowing Empress Irene. 
He was an energetic and competent emperor, although rash and impatient at times. In the early 9th century, the empire's eastern borders were beset by the Arabs, while its Balkan frontiers suffered constant raids by the Bulgars and the Slavs. The death of Harun al-Rashid in 809 started a civil war in the Caliphate and offered a respite from the former. This presented the emperor with an opportunity to deal with the Bulgars from a position of strength. In 811, he amassed an invasion force at an auspicious spot near Adrianople and marched it into Bulgar territory. Seeing an overwhelming size of the Roman army, Bulgar Han Krum sent calls for reinforcements to Slavs and Avars. Knowing he stood no chance against the full might of the empire in an open field, he withdrew to the mountains, leaving only a small garrison at his capital of Pliska. In a short time, Nikephoros had captured the settlement, seized the Bulgar treasury, and was celebrating his victory with his soldiers, drinking wine from Krum's own cellar. Nikephoros then ordered his army to pillage the countryside, hoping it would lure Krum into an open battle. After seeing that Krum would not bite, the emperor decided to return to his own territory, with his army sacking as many Bulgar settlements as they could along the way. The Romans were in a good mood. They just defeated the Bulgars twice, sacked and burned their capital, and were now looting their way back home. Nikephoros and high-ranking officers knew that Krum was still lurking in the mountains, but rank-and-file soldiers were sure that the Bulgars were no threat to them. Laxity had spread through the entire army, and soldiers even stopped following standard cautionary procedures when building camp. The path home took the Romans through a narrow mountain pass with a small river. When scouts informed Nikephoros about a tall wooden palisade and a trench that blocked the way ahead, the emperor realized that the Bulgars must be nearby, but did not inform his army, which settled for a night along the course of the river without constructing a proper war camp. This gave Krum an opportunity that he was not going to waste. All this time, while Romans were looting, pillaging, and losing their cohesion, Krum was preparing an ambush. His scouts were tracking the Byzantine army's movements, and his warriors were building palisades and ditches, like those spotted by the Romans. The Hun himself was gathering all the forces he could muster, arming even women. Joined now by his Slav and Avar allies, he ordered a night attack on the camp. Unprepared and surprised in their sleep, the Romans were unable to organize a defense. The emperor's tent was cut down, and Nikephoros was slain. Any group of Roman soldiers brave enough to stand their ground initially now ran for their lives in panic. The Bulgars chased them to that same palisade. With no route to escape, Roman soldiers piled on each other to get over the wooden wall, only to fall into the ditch on the other side. The Byzantine casualties were massive. Nikephoros' head, as the legend says, was made into a cup from which Krum would drink in celebration of his victory. Nikephoros' son Starakis was paralyzed from the waist down and would die in six months, putting an end to his dynasty. With the turmoil in the Caliphate, the Empire had a chance to recover from centuries of strife, reassert its control over the Balkans, and squash the Bulgar threat. This chance now lay dead on the riverbank, in a small mountain pass south of Pliska. Had Nikephoros succeeded in vanquishing the Bulgar state in 811, it is possible that the Bulgars would go the way of Huns, Avars, Vecinegs, and Khazars, nomadic peoples lost to history, a threat from forgotten times. But when the empire finally mustered its strength to break the Bulgars 200 years later, they were already settled people with their own written language and a sense of national identity. The identity that would survive hundreds of years of first Roman and then Turkish rule and emerge in 19th century as the modern Bulgarian state. I am imploring you to fight like men with brave souls, as you have done from the beginning up to this day against the enemy of our faith. I hand over to you, my glorious, famous, respected noble city, the shining queen of cities, our homeland.
You know well, my brothers, that we have four obligations in common, which force us to prefer death over survival. First, our faith and piety. Second, our homeland. Third, the emperor anointed by the Lord. And fourth, our relatives and friends. Present your shields, swords, arrows and spears, the descendants of the Greeks and the Romans, and consider how the commemoration of our death, our memory, fame and freedom can be rendered eternal. The last death on our list is unlike the others. In contrast to those, there is no hubris, carelessness and overconfidence. On the valor, self-sacrifice, and bravery in face of overwhelming odds. Throughout this video, I've often talked about how this or that emperor came to rule the empire during hard times. But for no one is that statement as true as for Constantine XI. In 1449, the empire was a bleak shadow of its former glory, consisting only of holdings in Peloponnese and the city of Constantinople and the new Ottoman Sultan, Mehmed II, proclaimed the conquest of the Roman capital to be his main goal. He found a pretext to break his earlier treaty with Constantine, and in April 1453 led an army of hundred thousands to the walls of Constantinople. The imperial capital, like the empire itself, was at that point but the remnant of what it once was. The walls in which a million people used to live now housed around 70,000 inhabitants and were defended only by 7,000 soldiers. Those 7,000s, however, were not going to surrender meekly. Firstly, they included 500 highly trained Genoese mercenaries led by a famous captain, Giovanni Giustiniani. And secondly, the emperor himself commanded and fought in the defense. Through two months of siege, regular assaults on the walls and constant bombardments, by the biggest cannons ever seen before, both Roman and Genoese warriors have proven their merit. But the defenders were spread too thin, having to man the whole length of the walls with fewer than 7,000 men. Both Giustiniani and the Emperor personally led counterattacks against Ottoman assaults, when in early May the huge Ottoman cannons breached the walls near the gates of St. Romanus and Blacerne Palace. Finally, on May 29th, the Sultan ordered an all-out assault. A portion of the wall was destroyed by a massive bombardment, and the Ottoman forces poured in. Giustiniani led the defense of the breach, but was badly wounded and carried off to the ships by his men. Constantine threw off his imperial regalia and roused his men in a final counterattack on the breach. There he fell defending his city to the last breath. A Greek legend tells that, in his last moments, Constantine was saved by the angel, immortalized in marble, and taken to a cave beneath the Golden Gate, where he slumbers, awaiting the call to retake his city. The demise of Eastern Roman Empire was not similar to its Western counterpart. Where the West was like a pathetic cripple, forgotten by everyone, and put out of his misery. The Eastern Empire was a dignified old warrior, frail of body but courageous of soul, preparing to die fighting in the last heroic stand, with his head up, a sword in hand, and a god's name on his lips. For this we have Constantine the Eleventh to thank, an emperor who chose to fall as his empire fell. Rest in peace, Marble Emperor, for you have secured the Roman legacy as that of bravery, heroism, and unwavering valor.